We left off, we were talking about Daniel and went through Daniel really quickly. Remember, he was during the, uh, the, the exilic period while they're in exile. Malachi is a book that we're going to talk about briefly today. Um, it takes place sometime in the post-exilic period, so like after they've returned from exile. Uh, Malachi, the name, actually means my messenger. So it could be a title rather than a name. We're not sure about that, but it's Malachi, my messenger. He is a cultic prophet. There is a strong influence of the priestly ideas in there. A very strong tie into the priesthood. It's concerned with proper worship, prosper conduct of the priest, and encouragement. Remember, all these end with encouragement and hope. All right, so today for the book of Malachi, I thought we would watch the uh, Bible Project video on Malachi. I love these Bible Project videos. You can get them online, just Bible Project. Uh, dot com and uh, they have all kinds of these ones give you a brief overview of all this they have one for every book of the bible uh, if you're interested in well what was that book about again i don't need to remember um these i think this one's like seven or eight minutes long all right let me go flip to that the book of the prophet malachi he lived about a hundred years after the Israelites had returned from their Babylonian exile, and his message was directed to the people who had been living in Jerusalem for some time now. The temple had been rebuilt a while ago, and things were not going well. Just remember the stories from Ezra and Nehemiah. Now, when the Israelites first returned from exile, their hopes were high. They would return and rebuild their lives and the temple. All of the great promises of the prophets would come true. The Messiah would come and set up God's kingdom over a unified Israel and over the nations and bring justice and peace for all. But that's not what happened. The Israelites who repopulated the city proved to be just as unfaithful to God as their ancestors, resulting in poverty and injustice. And so in Malachi, we find out just how corrupt this new generation has become. The book's designed as a series of disputes, and most sections begin with God saying something, making a claim or an accusation, and then Israel will disagree or question God's statement. And then God will respond and offer the last word. This happens six times. In the first three disputes, God exposes Israel's corruption, and in the final three disputes, he confronts their corruption. And the overall impression you get from these arguments and disputes is that the exile fundamentally didn't change anything in the people. Israel's hearts are as hard as ever. The first dispute starts when God says that he still loves his covenant people despite their failures. And Israel rudely objects, saying, how have you shown us any love? And so God reminds them of how he graciously chose the family of Jacob, their ancestor, to become the carrier of God's covenant promises, instead of Esau, his brother, and the family that came from him, who eventually came to ruin. Remember the stories from Genesis and the book of Obadiah. And so right from this first dispute, Israel is exposed as suspicious, doubting God's love and faithfulness. The second dispute exposes a problem with Israel's second temple. God accuses the people of despising and defiling the temple. And the people fire back, how have we despised you? And so God responds by focusing on the people, how they're bringing shamefully lame offerings of these sick, blemished animals that show that they don't value or honor their God. But it's not just the people, it's the priests, too, who run the temple. They not only tolerate, but participate in these corrupt forms of worship. From top to bottom, God's people have proven faithless. In the third dispute, God accuses the Israelite men of treachery against him and their wives, which, of course, they deny. And God exposes the toxic combination of idolatry and divorce taking place. You have Israelite men marrying non-Israelite women and then adopting the worship of their wives' ancestral gods into their home. Remember the story from Nehemiah chapter 13. And so Malachi connects this to a wave of men divorcing their wives for no good reason. And the people are all fine with this. And Malachi says, no, it's a betrayal of your covenant with God. And so Malachi transitions into the second set of disputes that confront Israel's rebellion. So the fourth dispute begins with the Israelites accusing God of neglect, saying, where is the God of justice? They see injustice and corruption abounding, and God seems to do nothing. 
So God responds by saying that he'll send a messenger who will prepare the people for God's personal return in the day of the Lord. He will come like fire to purify his people and to remove idolatry and sexual immorality and injustice so that only the faithful remnant is left to become his people. In the fifth dispute, God calls the people to turn back to him, to which the people say, how can we turn back? And so God confronts their selfishness. He shows how they've stopped offering a tithe of their income to the temple. Now, that word tithe just means one-tenth. It's the amount of their income and produce that the Israelites were to annually donate to support the temple and its priests. The practice is laid out in different parts of the Torah. Now we know from Malachi and from the book of Nehemiah that the people were neglecting this responsibility. And so the temple was falling into disrepair. And so God confronts them. He says he wants to bless them with abundance, but only if they're going to be faithful. In the final dispute, the people accuse God and say that it's pointless to serve him. They observe wicked, prideful people succeeding in life, and God does nothing. And God's response, for the first time in the book, is not a speech, but rather a short story about the faithful remnant in Israel, people who fear the Lord, and they love to get together and talk about how to honor God and serve him. And so God orders that a scroll of remembrance be written for these people so that they can read the scroll and remember God's character and promises. Malachi, he's reflecting here on the divine gift of the scriptures, how they point us to the past to remember what God has done in order to inspire faithfulness and hope for the future. Which leads to the conclusion of the book. It picks up and develops the imagery of the fourth dispute about the coming day of the Lord, but it develops it further. God says that he's appointed a day of purifying judgment that will consume the wicked from among his people. But what the conclusion adds is the future of the faithful remnant. Because for them, the day of the Lord is not a threat. It's a cause for joy. It'll be like the rays of the rising sun that bring healing and life and hope for the future. And so Malachi's disputes come to a close, but there's still a bit more to this book. The final three verses, they're not part of the disputes, and actually they function like a concluding appendix, bringing closure not just to Malachi, but to the whole collection of the Torah and the prophets. So first, the reader is called to remember the law, or the Torah, of my servant Moses. This recalls the story and the laws of the covenant that you find in the first five books of the Bible. But then we hear this summary of the books of the prophets. I will send the prophet Elijah before the day of the Lord, who will restore the hearts of God's people. So this conclusion, it summarizes the Torah and the prophets as a unified story that points to the future. Israel was redeemed by God, and then they betrayed him through their rebellion and hard hearts, breaking the laws of the Torah. But the scriptures anticipate a future day when God's going to send a new prophet, a Moses, a new Elijah, who will restore God's people and heal their hard hearts. Remember all of the promises from Deuteronomy and Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And so this concluding appendix presents the scriptures as a divine gift to read and to ponder and to pray over. They tell the truth about the human condition, about our selfishness and our sin. But they also announce God's promise that one day he would send a messenger and then show up personally to confront evil, to restore his people and bring his healing justice. And it's that future hope that Malachi and the Torah and all of the prophets are about. Don't you just love the artwork of those videos? They are so aesthetically appeasing. I love watching them. And every video they do, they spend so much time deciding exactly how they want to artwork it so that it's accurate to the scriptures. So the artwork is not a mistake. It's beautiful. Um, yeah, that great, great uh, travel through the book of Malachi and my messenger where God points to a future that we know is Jesus Christ. All the Bible leads up to a future hope that is Jesus Christ. And uh, that's what Malachi is about. It's all about the messenger of God bringing a time of encouragement. Um, the next book, and I'm going to say the, the video for Joel is actually pretty good too, but I thought two in a row might be a bit much. Um, Joel. Joel is another book that uh, is actually really short, um, 
we could probably look at some of it. Um, it's really only three chapters long. Um, we're not exactly clear as to when it was written. I think the last thing I read was maybe between 500 and 350 BC. So sometime in the post-exilic period. Um, Job is actually, Joel is actually quite unique in the prophets. Um, one, it doesn't give us a time when it's written. There's no king mention, no, like, this is, it was written during this time and that time. There's, there's none of that. Um, it just says, the word Lord came to Joel, son of Puthuel. Hear this, your elders listen, all you inhabitants of the land. Has anything happened in days, anything happened in your days or in the days of your ancestors? There's no introductory about when this takes place, when he, exactly who he's writing it to, which is a, a unique thing in the prophets. Another thing that's kind of unique about this is the scriptural references that are in this book. As you read through the book of Joel, you're going to see him reference Malachi, Obadiah, Ezekiel, Zephaniah, Nahum, Isaiah, Amos, Exodus. He is a man of study. And of course, when you read the book of Joel, he, and sometimes it's a little puzzling because he assumes that you have read the scrolls too. <laughs> um, he has assumed you are a studier too. And so if you're not studying these other books that he kind of alludes to but doesn't like go into all this depth about some of these ideas, you might get a little confused because he just assumes you know some of this stuff. And some of the references, you know, and it's not like they didn't do back then like we do now. Like if I quote someone, I have to tell you where I got it, what page number it was on, you can go find it. They didn't have to do any of that. They just assumed you would know it. And if you want to know it, you can go find it. Um, there was no reference guide. I mean, if there was, Hebrews would be chock full of footnotes. <laughs> um, Cross-referencing the book of Hebrews is amazing. Um, another thing that's unique about the book of Joel is it never accuses Israel of any specific sin. It never says, this is your sin. It just kind of assumes you already know that it's what you guys are doing now and what your ancestors have done before. So it assumes, once again, you've already studied the other problem, the other, and say it's just the same things being repeated. So he never calls out like a specific sin and says, this is, you know, this is what I'm telling you. He says, how's this? Has anything like this ever happened in your days and the days of the ancestors? Tell your children about it. Let your children tell their children and the children of the next generation what devouring locusts have left the swarming locusts have eaten. Um, this book is actually prophetic and apocalyptic in the sense that it's all about the uh, hidden, uh, the revealing of hidden. It uh, has very apocalyptic literature that we would expect to see, like in the book of Revelation or in Daniel's Apocalypse. Um, that is, you know, the day of the Lord and these hidden messages. Um, chapter 1 and 2 really describe the day of the Lord. So chapter 1, um, they show the day of the Lord as past event that points to the future. So chapter 1, the locusts are coming. Now, as soon as we say the locusts are coming, it should bring to mind Exodus, the eighth plague. And he assumes that it's bringing that to mind. But what's different about the eighth plague here is in Exodus, the, it was directed to the Egyptians. It says, now... Because of your sins, your apostasy, it will be directed towards you, the Israelites. And the, lo the locusts will be coming. 
chapter 2 plays on the idea of the locust again. The great day of the Lord is coming, and this locust will come. It starts out kind of more of a locust is coming again, and the, the darkness of the sun. Um, but it takes on a, um, a military sp- speech. As you see, it becomes more military. The locusts kind of seem to be morphing or just described differently as the army of the Lord. And they have all this army speech going on, this military speech. And, um, and, and, and that's one of the reasons, that's one of, that's, this is where we get, you know, the darkening of the sun and the moon turning to blood is a sign of the approach. You never heard that, you know, gone outside and seen the blood red moon and wonder if there's a rapture, you know. It comes from this book right here where people are talking about the blood red moon as a sign of the approach. Um, In chapter 2, chapter, uh, Joel 2, 13b, actually, um, he kind of answers the question, why should we change our ways? Um, and he actually quotes from Exodus 34, 6. Um, why should we change our ways? Because he is gracious and compassionate and slow to anger, great in love and relenting from harm. We should change our ways because God is gracious, because he is slow to anger, because he has shown grace and compassion on us. This God's mercy is more powerful than his wrath. And because of his mercy, we should change our ways. Chapter 3 is, um, chapter 1 and 2 were like a past event that affects the future. Like, chapter 3 is more focused on the future day of the Lord. Like, these were past days of the Lord, you know, like focused on like the locusts of Egypt affecting the future. And this is more like a future time when when God will judge his people like a farmer harvesting grain, the nations will be cut down. And all the nations will be, um, will be affected. And this, this day of judgment will be a time of justice. But it will also bring out, if you read the, the, the end of Joel, it brings out really a time of New Eden. Um, then you will know that I am the Lord your God who dwells in Zion, my holy mountain. Jerusalem will be holy and foreigners will never overrun it. In the day the mountain will drip like sweet wine, the hills flowing with milk. Going back to that land of milk and honey that was promised before. All the streams of Judah will flow with water and spring from issues from the house Going back to the ideas of the Garden of Eden, where the, the, the rivers flowed from the Garden of Eden. And um, so it'll be a, a place of um, a, where, where, where Jerusalem will once again be a new Eden, and um, in the end, all will be made new. All will be made new. And I will pardon their blood guilt, which I have not pardoned, for the Lord dwells in Zion. So it's a really a, a fun book that um, that does focus on um, on even though the Lord's going to come, and you we've you guys have done so bad, and the day of the Lord has come, will come again because you guys are, there is this future hope that it will be made new again and God will restore justice to the earth, which culminates in Jesus. Uh, All right, so we're right on track to watch the next video.
this is a video on the thematic one of the day of the Lord, not taken just from the prophets. Remember that each prophet uses the day of the Lord slightly different, but, we're, but this video looks more of a, as a thematic, as the, the bigger theme of the day of the Lord. playing earlier. I'll go back to the back and find out what's going on. The day of the Lord. It's a phrase in the Bible that religious people use, usually when talking about the end of the world. Yeah, things like Armageddon or the apocalypse. You might be familiar with this image of Jesus returning on a white horse. He's got a sword to bring final judgment. And everyone wants to know, how will it all go down? So a lot of these images come from the last book of the Bible, but to understand them, you have to go back to the first book. When the story begins, we watch God create an amazing world, and then he gives humans power to rule over it on his behalf. But the humans are tempted by this mysterious, unhuman character who offers them a promise. You could define good and evil on your own terms and put yourselves in God's place. Which is what they do. And the resulting stories are about the broken relationships and violence that results. Yeah, this promise creates huge problems. Now everyone has to protect themselves and fight for survival, and they're all using death as this weapon to gain power. It all leads to a story about the building of the city of Babylon. Or in Hebrew, Babel. Everyone comes together to elevate themselves to the place of God. And God knows how devastating this could be. A whole culture redefining good and evil as if they are God. So God confuses their language and scatters them. Now from here on, Babylon becomes like an icon in the biblical story. It's an image that represents humanity's corporate rebellion against God. And the next time we see it is in the story of ancient Egypt. Yeah, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, he feels threatened by these immigrant Israelites. He starts killing all of the boys, enslaving the rest. And this is really evil. Yeah, Egypt's like this bigger, badder Babylon. They take care of themselves at the expense of others by redefining evil as good. And so God turns Pharaoh's evil back on him. His pride drives him forward, and he's swallowed up by death. Now, after this great deliverance, the Israelites sing a song about how God is their warrior who liberated them from evil. And the Israelites referred to this moment as the day. The day they were rescued from a corrupt human system. And every year since then, the Israelites have celebrated the day of their liberation with this symbolic meal of a sacrificial lamb that's called Passover. Eventually, Israel comes into its own land, have their own kings, and they face new enemies. So that past day of the Lord, celebrated every Passover, begins to generate hope that God will bring the day again to save Israel from new threats. Now, out in the hills was a sheep herder named Amos. He was appointed by God as a prophet to announce shocking news to Israel, that God was bringing another day of the Lord against his enemies, and this time the target is Israel. What? Sadly, Israel's leaders had also redefined good and evil for themselves, resulting in corruption and violence. So God's people have become like Babylon, the oppressed become oppressors. Babylon seems like a trap no one can escape. And so the day of the Lord comes upon Israel. They're conquered, taken captive into exile. And from then on, Israel suffered under the rule of continuous oppressive empires. This is the story Jesus was born into. Yeah, in his day, the oppressive empire over Israel is Rome. So is Jesus going to confront Rome, take him out? Well, no. Jesus saw the real enemy as that mysterious, unhuman evil. The evil that's lured Babylon, Egypt, Rome, Israel. All humanity has given in to evil's promise of power. This is what Jesus resisted alone in the wilderness when he was tempted to exploit his power for self-interest. But he didn't. 
And after that, he started to confront the effects of evil on others. Yeah, he started saying that he was going to Jerusalem for Passover for a final showdown to confront the evil of Israel and Rome by dying. Dying? I mean, that feels like losing. Jesus was going to let evil exhaust all of its power on him, using its only real weapon, death. Jesus knew that God's love and life were even more powerful, that he could overcome evil by becoming the Passover lamb, giving his life in an act of love. And something changed that day. When Jesus defeated evil, he opened up a new way for anyone to escape from Babylon and discover this new kind of power, this new way of being human. Okay, so something changed. But the power of evil is still alive and well, and we keep building new versions of Babylon. Right, and so the last book of the Bible, the Revelation, points to the future and final day of the Lord. It's when God's kingdom comes to confront Babylon the Great, this image of all the corrupt nations of the world. Yeah, this is it, Armageddon, final judgment. How is Jesus going to finish off evil? Well, it's not how you'd expect. In the Revelation, the victorious Jesus is symbolized by a sacrificial bloody lamb. And then when Jesus does arrive in the end, riding his white horse to confront evil, he's bloodied before the battle even starts. Pre-bloodied? That's a strange image. Yeah, it's because Jesus isn't out for our blood. Rather, he overcame with his blood when he died for his enemies. And the sword is in his mouth. It's a symbol of Jesus' authority to define good and evil and hold us accountable when he brings final justice once and for all. And so, in the meantime, the day of the Lord is an invitation to resist the culture of Babylon. And it's a promise that God will one day free our world from corruption and bring about the new things that he has in store. Thanks for watching The Bible Project. This theme video is one of many that we make, and you can watch them here on our YouTube channel or on our website. We're a nonprofit and we're crowdfunded, which means that you can help us make the next video. You can learn more and help us at thebibleproject.com. All right. What do you think of that video? Yeah, I like that one. It kind of brings, their theme videos kind of bring a lot of ideas together and uh, they work very hard. Uh, if you go and listen to their podcast, like the Day of the Lord, uh, I think has seven podcasts to go along with it for that little video, uh, where they talk through all the different elements of it, and then they whittle it down to one short video for everyone to see. Um, and so obviously there's things that are left out and there's, um, you know, ideas that you don't get to come, but they do a really good job. And of course the artist work is always amazing and, uh, and whatnot. So wonderful experience. And I like that video right there because it's, it's, we've been talking a lot about the day of Lord, but it's not, we, it's not something we've really had time to address as a whole, especially since we've been focusing on the Old Testament and yeah, the day of the Lord doesn't end with the Old Testament. It goes into the New Testament and throughout the whole scriptures. So, All right, any questions about that or anything we want to say? No? All right, well, let's talk briefly about Esther. Now, I know from when we did this as a sermon series that many of you, this is your favorite book. Um. This is a, a wonderful book um, set in the Persian kingdom. So after Cyrus has come in and conquered the Babylonians and probably even sent them on a lot of the Jews home. Um, so mid 5th century BC. Um, interesting enough about this book, <coughs> God is not mentioned at all. In this book. Now, if you read some of the later additions to this book, God is in them. And mostly, I think, to try to put God back into the stories. But God is throughout the stories, even if he's not mentioned. And, um, and remember, uh, as we preached through, as I preached through this a while back ago, 
And you can still go listen to my sermon series online. Go to LaughlinChurch.com, go to sermons, and then you can look up the sermon series on Esther. Um, I forget how many sermons I did on that, quite a few. Um, God is throughout the whole thing. And, but this, this book is used every year at the Feast of Purim. It's read every year out loud. Uh, let's talk about the story. The story goes that um, Xerxes, uh, Xerxes I, which is in 485 to 464 B.C., uh, has a banquet for his friends, uh, showing off all his wealth, um, wants to show off his queen to Vishti, Vashti, calls her to appear, uh, she refuses, um, and of course that sets up a national search for a replacement queen. Esther, the beautiful girl, um, will, um, the Jewish girl, reared by her elderly cousin Mordecai, he's a court official, head of the Persian secret service, um, and a national contest is held to find out, and um, it's... I mean, we often relate it to a beauty contest, but it's more involved than that. There's, I mean, there's definitely uh, good looks are part of it. You know, they have to appear. And there's also sleeping with the king and the uh, way you dress and act and um, all this stuff. Um, and Esther has to be, to conceal the fact that she's a Jew. Uh, she's chosen to be king. Uh, queen, interestingly enough, is, you know, if she was not chosen a queen, she would still probably be part of his harem. It's not like, oh, well, she, if she's not chosen, she gets to go free. She's still part of his harem, his, his, his collection of women that he has. So this way, she gets to be like the head of the collection of women, not just part of it. Um, a lot of people are like, well, she just shouldn't have refused. And it's not... I've heard that too many times. Well, she could have refused. No, she couldn't. He was the king. Called her to come before him. Part of the beauty pageant, if you want to call it a beauty pageant, involves staying overnight with the king. And uh, he would have been, she would have been part of the harem. And, uh, and if he threw her out, she would be considered you worthless in that, that Persian society. Um, but she is chosen to be queen. Um, but she has to hide the fact that she's a Jew. Mordecai, in the, and while she's queen, uh, learns of a plot against the king. And through Esther, he is able to warn the king about this plot. And that sets him up to be honored later on. Now, Haman, um, which if you remember during the Feast of Purim, anytime Haman's name, and they used the clackers and the yelling and the screaming and to blot his name out so you wouldn't be able to hear it from heaven because, you know, God, you can't even let God hear his name. He's so evil. Um, Haman, the Agite, um, the prime minister, you might say, um, is mad at Mordecai, a lot of it because Mordecai refuses to bow to him. And um, Haman decides to get rid of Mordecai. And since Mordecai is a Jew, uh, Haman decides to get rid of all Jews. Might as well, right? If you're going to do it, do it right. Um, Haman will cast lots on when the date will be set to get rid of the Jews, and that's why Purim is called Purim. It means to cast lots. And so uh, using um, persuasion and a large bribe, Haman uh, convinced, that on a certain, convinced the king that on a certain day the Jews should be killed. 
Um, and the king, not realizing still that Esther was a Jew. Now, Mordecai goes into mourning. And Esther risked her life to speak to the king, inviting the king and Haman to dinner. And very smart. She, she uses food. And Haman honor, was honored at the invite, went. Um, and since he's celebrating, he decided to have gallows made in his garden so that he can watch the hanging of um, and killing of the Jews uh, in his garden. Um, nice guy. Um, now, hanging at this time very likely did not mean like we think of with a noose and the it more than likely meant pushing them off, or you would push them onto a spear, uh, a spear or a, a lance, and letting the the spear slowly impel you as you sat on it. Um, that was more what hanging probably meant at the time period, and gallows was what you pushed them off onto the spear from. Um, so it probably was not done in the humane manner with the rope and the calculations of body weight and length of rope to make sure it broke your neck instead of decapitating. Because if you, even with a rope, if you have it too long, it decapitates you. If it's too short, you sit and struggle and 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 and, and die slowly. Um, but this one was designed more to be slow and to show off the the king's power and to ward away enemies because their bodies would be left for days um, on these spears, on these, um, these spears. Um, so, yeah, he wants it done in his garden. Um, I don't know about you, but that's the perfect garden uh, motif, uh, decorations. We, some people have gnomes, other people have hanging dead people. Um, Now, the king, during this time, has a sleepless night, and he reads, has the chronicles of his courts read to him, which will put anyone to sleep, and uh, they happen to read about how Mordecai has saved his life, and he gets to think, he says, well, we never honored Mordecai for saving my life. Next day, he asks Haman, how would he honor a person that's of oh, great, and Haman, of course, being selfish, thinks it's him. And he says, clad the person in kingly robes and put him on the king's horse and lead him by the streets of the capital. And, and of course, um, the king says, that sounds great. Do that to Mordecai. And, of course, Haman wants to kill Mordecai as it is. This just solidifies we need to kill this man who's stealing all my thunder. Um, Haman does seem like he wants to become the next king. Now the king, um, the day of the dinner comes and, and, and she cooks for them and they're sitting in the function. They don't sit on tables with chairs and I know, um, Da Vinci painted them with chairs and that's not how they would have sat. They would have been on cushions, uh, reclining. And, um, and uh, King asks what she wants him to do. And she eventually reveals that she's a Jew and pleads for her life. And she tells him that Haman is the cause of all her troubles. Well, the king leaves in anger, and Haman throws himself at the feet of the queen as she's reclining, and the king walks in and sees Haman pleading and thinks he's trying to rape her. Now, it's bad enough that it sees that he's trying to rape his queen, but by raping his queen, it had been like claiming that he is the king. This is like a huge offense. Um more because 
given the time period, more because he's trying to claim his right as king than raping a woman. Uh, though that was illegal, but not for the court, apparently. Because uh, that happens all the time. You know. But um, he sees her and thinks he's trying to rape her, and Haman is hung on the gallows that he has made for Mordecai. Um, so because the king is seen as godlike or even as a god, he cannot, however, change his decree that has already gone out that on this day the Jews would be destroyed. But what he can do is send out a decree that the Jews are now allowed to defend themselves. So, which would, in fact, stop most people from attacking them. You know, we're not going to attack someone that's going to defend themselves. We're going to leave, let it be. Um, but the Jews actually take a, uh, this opportunity to rid themselves of enemies throughout the country. And um, Mordecai will become the essential, the prime minister, the, to Haman's job. Um, Purim itself is a secular holiday. It's not considered a religious, well, as we would consider a religious holiday. It's a holiday that, uh, a Jewish holiday celebrating the overcoming of an anti-Semitic plot. Um, so it wouldn't have like the great overtones of like some of the other holidays that are all about God and, and, and this is, yes, God's protection, but it's more seen as a um, an overcoming of an anti-Semitic plot. And therefore, it has been used as a time of hope and celebration throughout generation and generation and generation as anti-Semitism seems to be a, a running theme in a lot of history. I mean, here in the United States, there was a lot of anti-Semitism. Uh, seems to be still some lingering. Um, in some areas, but that doesn't surprise me because the people that were grew up in this are still running the nation. Um, but, um, but yeah, the, the I mean, I was reading what was I reading? Oh, I was a Stephen King novel, um, and I was amazed at how much anti-Semitism was in that book. And it wasn't something that he thought about as being like anti-Semitism. It was just part of the culture where he lived. And he was repeating, he was making it sound believable for the time period he was writing this book. Um, you know, and that's, that's the way it was, you know. In the later interviews, he said, you know, no, if I was to write that now, of course I wouldn't write it. Because it wouldn't be believable for now. It wouldn't be right. But for then, it was. And... Um, Yes, I read Stephen King. I'm sorry. <laughs> Before I get angry emails, I read a little bit of everything. Um, though he's not my favorite author. Um, but yeah, uh, anti-Semitism is, is a, a running theme. And... Uh, and even in a lot of our theology that I've read in, um, that influenced the church for many years, I was reading a, a commentary um, that was written in the 40s, I guess it was, and it was using deconstructionism um, from German um, scholars that were trying to basically pull Jesus out of its Jewish roots. Um, because of anti-Semitism, and, uh, and it influenced a great, and this was a very popular book for th seminaries up until recently, um, because, uh, and, but so it's been very something that's been very, and so, but so as we think about Purim, it's a celebration against that way of thinking. It's a celebration for the Jewish people to say, hey, we may be hated 
throughout history, it seems. But God will support us and get us through these hardships and lead us through it. Um, So it's a great book of rejoicing. And of course, Esther is seen as a woman of virtue and a a, uh, honorable woman and, uh, and, uh, and, and a woman of wisdom. As we saw in that sermon series I did, I went to the Proverbs a lot when I went through the book of of this uh, of the book of Esther because she's seen as a woman of wisdom. Um, all right. Any questions about that? Anything we want to say? All right. So next week we're going to start in on wisdom and poetic literature. I don't know how long we're going to stay in that. Um. I do know that we're going to be done with the Old Testament by Christmas, maybe a couple weeks before. I don't know what we'll do between there, but I don't want to start to the New Testament until after Christmas because so we might have a couple of weeks to kill, but I'm going to get us through the Old Testament <laughs> by, Easter, by Christmas, so we'll, we'll see how it goes, um, but I want, us to, I want to start with the New Testament after the holiday after the holiday so but we're going to be in wisdom and poetic literature um, which will be psalms proverbs joe ecclesiastes uh, song of solomon's Um, we'll start in on that next week any questions statements comments concerns yet nine nope all right Let's go ahead and close in prayer. Yahweh Adonai, Lord God, we praise you today, Lord. We thank you for this wonderful blessing. We thank you for all that you've done for us, Lord. We pray that you just uh, help us be blessed by your scriptures, Lord. I know that I am every time I study your scriptures, Lord. I, I pray that we have a good solid foundation so that we can go through this. But, Lord, I pray that we just read this with honesty and we just look for it. And as we know that we need to understand it as it was written, Lord. We don't want to rewrite your scriptures. We just want to reread it. And Lord, we pray you focus on it, Lord, and just um, be, be wrapped up in your arms. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.